Good morning and welcome to the third and final day of the Films of State Conference. My name is Oliver Geiken. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland College Park and I'll be the moderator for this panel, Government and Its People. I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists, then we will watch their presentations and proceed to a question and answer period. At any point during the uh, talks and thereafter, you can type your questions into the question and answer box. Our first presenter today is Noah Tsika, an associate professor at Queens College CUNY. Uh, he has written four books, Gods and Monsters, a queer film classic, Nollywood Stars, Media and Migration in West Africa and the Diaspora, Pink 2.0, Encoding Queer Cinema on the Internet, and Traumatic Imprints, Cinema, Military Psychiatry, and the Aftermath of War. And a program note, uh, Professor Tsika will not be able to join us for the Q&A today, but he did send in his talk, which we will start with. The second presentation today is by Tanya Goldman, a PhD candidate in cinema studies at New York University. Her work has appeared in Cineast, Cinema Journal, uh, Feminist Media Histories, Film History, and the edited volume Screening Race in American Non-Theatrical Film. Tanya will be followed by Stephen Charbonneau, an associate professor at Florida Atlantic University. He has written a book entitled Projecting Race, Post-War America, Civil Rights, and Documentary Film. And he's currently writing a second book entitled Stoney, A Committed Life, A Committed Cinema, about the documentarian George C. Stoney, whose filmmaking frequently took place in the context of government projects. Finally, uh, we will hear a presentation by Catherine Harrington, a graduate student in the Screen Cultures program at Northwestern University. Her presentation today is drawn from her dissertation, which considers prison media from the 1970s forward. And as uh, on all of our panels, we're also, enjoyed, uh, we're also uh, joined by a member of the National Archives staff. Uh, this, uh, uh, the, the member today is Alexandra Geitz, who is a supervisory archivist. So um, those are the introductions. Uh, please enjoy the presentations. My name is Noah Sika. I'm a professor of media studies at Queens College City University of New York. And I'm going to be sharing some research conducted for a forthcoming book on Hollywood's incursions into post-independence Nigeria. The book is forthcoming from the University of California Press. And like my previous books, it draws extensively on government documents housed at the National Archives. Most useful are the records of the U.S. Department of State, which detail all manner of consular and corporate attempts to make sense of post-colonial Nigeria. Such documents indicate the intense interest with which newly independent Nigeria was viewed by U.S. government officials and Hollywood insiders alike. As Eric Smudin notes, historians had paid relatively little attention to Hollywood's foreign markets and almost none to Nigeria. The same cannot be said, however, either for the U.S. government or for Hollywood companies, as State Department records alone attest. When in 1948 the American trade paper The Film Daily asked, can Hollywood movies be so bad when they inspire gals in Nigeria? It established certain rhetorical norms for those who sought to describe and excuse the industry's ongoing incursions into the African continent. But it was also drawing on the U.S. government's own ways of advancing Nigeria's Americanization. By 1963, the United States Information Agency, USIA, was announcing that Hollywood's image was not so bad in post-independence Nigeria where, according to the agency's statistics, among those who cannot read, an average of 38% are regular moviegoers. 
That the movies to which such Nigerians subjected themselves were Hollywood productions was an article of faith at the USIA, whose professional surveys, reportedly conducted by independent, impartial institutes of public opinion, and initially reserved for official use only, found that preference for and enjoyment of Hollywood films was pronounced, and that impressions of America obtained from these films are generally favorable. Beginning as early as the 1950s, Nigeria was also the subject of U.S. Department of Commerce publications that stressed the country's promise for, among other pursuits, theatrical exhibition. These two were generative speech acts, performative reflections of the need to establish overseas markets and investment outlets. Articulations of entwined national and business interests, they suggest a certain kinship between Hollywood and the U.S. government that standard film histories, with their focus on federal antitrust legislation and other state-imposed impediments, tend to belie. By the middle of the 20th century, Nigeria had become a key site in which such entwinement, such state-private symbiosis, could be elaborated, including in the arena of theatrical exhibition. United Artists production executive Stephen Bach, whose company was installed in Nigeria by 1961, noted that practices very much like block booking were still common internationally and actively supported by the U.S. government, even after the major studios entered into a consent decree with the U.S. Department of Justice in 1948. What was forbidden at home was permitted, even actively encouraged, abroad, making decolonizing population-dense Nigeria one of the cauldrons in which an ostensibly Americanizing stew could, by mid-century, be stirred. In the spring of 1960, the U.S. Department of Commerce announced that Nigeria exhibited more than average promise for the expansion of American exports, including cinematic ones. Hollywood, which has always enjoyed considerable diplomatic backing, proved especially responsive to the discourses of Nigerian exceptionalism circulating in and through the international diplomatic community. Consider, for instance, Arnold Rivkin's 1962 description of Nigeria as an oasis of democratic development in an arid desert of authoritarian-inclined African states. The director of MIT's Project on African Economic and Political Development, Rivkin considered Nigeria a unique nation, exceptional both on its own sociocultural and certainly mineral terms, and as a potentially economically strong and politically stable ally of the West, integrated into the global capitalist order. In 1961, Rivkin would inform the House Committee on Foreign Affairs that Nigeria was a society very responsive to economic incentives, and his confidence in the country was borne out by the decision of Hollywood Studios to set up permanent offices there, which they did by 1962. Nigeria, what Rivkin, extending his exceptionalist rhetoric, called an oasis of rationality in a sea of unreason, was considered a natural home for Hollywood interests committed to expansion after the collapse of the studio system. Notwithstanding the industry's active interest in South Africa and Zimbabwe, Hollywood embraced Lagos in the 1960s in ways that echoed the U.S. Department of State's view of Nigeria as the most important country in Africa. Praising Nigeria in the wake of independence in 1960 was the State Department's way of building on its earlier pre-independence articulation of the African continent's significance as a geographical area four times the size of the U.S., producing minerals and primary agricultural products of great importance to America. Outside of the State Department, but hardly untethered to it, the Ford, Carnegie, and Rockefeller Foundations were committed to demonstrating the cultural and economic value of Africa in general, and Nigeria in particular, bolstering U.S.-backed economic planning units, including at the University of Ife. 
Their efforts may have been mired in superficial generalizations, prejudice, and blind faith in the rational methods of the social sciences, but they were remarkably effective. Exerting a pull on Hollywood studios already drawn to Nigeria, and all too happy to accept and even trumpet social scientific justifications for their collective commercial interest in Lagos. That Nigeria was, around the time of independence, frequently a testing ground for American media companies had everything to do with its exceptionality. Its population size, vast reserves of natural resources, especially oil, and initially incontestable promise as a major world economy. Nigeria was the first African country to receive a substantial development grant from the United States, a $225 million independence gift offered in 1961. Unsurprisingly, given this broad commitment to capital development, a kind of Nigeria first policy of Hollywood internationalism, a belief in Nigeria's status as bellwether of Africa's challenges and opportunities, had matured by the early 1960s, uniting the industry's needs across media forms and practices as they consistently coalesced around an emerging nation of great and growing potential. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Tanya Goldman, a PhD candidate in cinema studies at NYU, and I'll be talking about how the U.S. Treasury Department enlisted non-theatrical film distributors in its war bond drive campaigns. I contend that the prominent place of non-theatrical films within these drives and the millions of Americans who attended and sometimes even organized local screenings helped pave the way for the mass adoption of 16 millimeter film in the post-war period. On October 29th, 1945, the U.S. Treasury Department launched its Victory War Bond Drive. This campaign was the eighth such drive organized by the department's War Finance Division since 1942 and marked the culmination of four years of extensive activity that drove millions of Americans to buy government saving bonds, generating over $100 billion in revenue. In the weeks prior to the drive, 16 millimeter distributors and community organizers across the country received notices from the Office of War Information and special events campaign booklets from the Treasury to help them prepare for the drive. Accompanying the booklet was a five and a half minute informational film, a preview of coming attractions for what the Treasury promised was, quote, the most powerful 16 millimeter film program yet developed, end quote. Recipients held preview screenings of this film for local journalists and bond selling representatives to get the word out. Here are some excerpts from the film. The motion picture and special events section of the War Finance Division of the United States Treasury presents your most comprehensive program for the Victory Loan. Here is a program of service for all committees in all communities. Promotion, events, and ideas for agriculture, industrial, banks, retail, schools, and women's committees. <laughs> Treasury films for the Victory Loan are the best yet produced. Fifteen dramatic bond-selling motion pictures are available for you in this drive. 16 millimeter Victory Loan film distributors will have quantities of prints on hand, enough to service every community. They open the doors for you to tell your bond-selling story at your county and city schools, retail stores, banks, industrial plants, civic clubs. Number one film of the Victory Loan, with a dramatic message from President Truman. A picture filled with the drama of the jungle war for the lifeline to China. full of hard-hitting film bulletins from the Navy and three Victory Loan screen songs help to round out your lineup of 16 millimeter films. They're yours to help finish the job. In what follows, the film lists several special event tie-ins, including a national parade day scheduled for October 29th. The film also urged organizers to collaborate with local theater owners, and here is the ending of the film. 
Watch your mail for flash bulletins. They'll tell you the latest news about motion pictures and special events. Study your special events campaign book for local promotion suggestions. Service to help you finish the job is our slogan. When the drive ended in mid-December, the Treasury reported more than 146,000 non-theatrical screenings. They had occurred in all 48 states, Puerto Rico, and at domestic Army and Navy bases from coast to coast. Non-theatrical networks had reached an audience exceeding 32 million Americans, which was only 1 million less than during the previous record-setting seventh war bond drive, which took place before the armistice with Japan. Scholars such as Greg Waller and Heidi Wasson have noted that 16 millimeter truly came of age during the Second World War. This was particularly the case within the context of the military's use of 16 millimeter for training films, tactical purposes, and more. Significantly less attention has been paid to how non-theatrical networks and government-sponsored films were mobilized on the home front to help win the war by communicating with civilians about how they could do their part to support the war effort. Quite analogous to the U.S. Army, domestic activities also required tremendous tactical coordination. In bringing informational films to communities nationwide, bank lobbies, department stores, factories, libraries, and more transformed into makeshift movie theaters. In the time that remains, I will sketch the behind the scenes bureaucratic and logistical processes that propelled non-theatrical films from coast to coast during war bond drives. Within days of Pearl Harbor, FDR famously proclaimed that movies would help win the war. In June 1942, he created the Office of War Information to streamline propagandistic activities previously taking place across disparate government offices. In August 1942, the OWI's non-theatrical division launched an ambitious production schedule for civilian informational films and announced plans to appoint three regional 16mm distribution directors to manage regional affairs outside New York and D.C. Monthly bulletins kept an ever-growing contingent of distributors, film depositories, and organizers abreast of forthcoming productions and tactics to efficiently keep all films and the nation's 25,000 60mm projectors in constant operation. Unfortunately, these ambitious plans were scaled back following dramatic congressional budget cuts in the summer of 1943. Non-theatrical division remained Individual government offices were now tasked with commissioning their own films, and the OWI unit would serve as a liaison between production agents and distributors. The U.S. Treasury formally incorporated non-theatrical film screenings into its promotional plan during the fifth war bond drive in the spring of 1943. Film would remain a part of all three of its subsequent drives in 44 and 45. One star of our story is Ted Gamble, a prominent film exhibitor from the Pacific Northwest who joined the Treasury's War Finance Division to promote bond sales early in the war. On the 16 millimeter front, our stars are C.R. Reagan and Merriman H. Holtz. A Texas native, C.R. Reagan, president of the National Association of Visual Education Dealers, served as head of the OWI's non-theatrical division throughout the war. He worked closely with Merriman Holtz, the Treasury's designated 16 millimeter consultant. These men in turn were supported by a national 16 millimeter film committee composed of business leaders from across the country. From this advisory leadership, coordination efforts trickled down. For all four bond drives, each state was designated a 16 millimeter state chairman who in turn was tasked with communicating with local 16 millimeter exhibitors across the state. War bond drives were driven by tremendous local initiative. On the left, you'll see an ad from Film World, a 16 millimeter trade journal 
That's asking for local projectionists to participate in War Bond Drive film screening efforts. Katherine Kramer Brownwell has written about the activities of J.E. Morton, a Michigan-based auto worker and father of a soldier who organized screenings in his community. From her essay here on the right is a drawing from the National Archives collection of a flyer developed for a program in the state of Tennessee. To wrap up, what this talk hopes to show is that bringing nonfiction film to American civilians during the Second World War required tremendous tactical coordination among a diverse ecosystem of players. This process entailed unprecedented collaboration between government bureaucrats and consultants, non-theatrical and visual education industry leaders, and hundreds of distributors, as well as the can-do initiative of local civic groups and patriotic individuals. In this way, millions of Americans directly participated in nonfiction film culture for the first time. And through these wartime experiences, cinema became knowable as a distinctively civic practice on a mass scale, anticipating the film council movement and mass expansion of the educational film market in the post-war period. Thank you. And now a salute to the conference organizers and to all of the archives who've made my research possible. As we're now well into year two of COVID-19, I am more grateful than ever for the digitization efforts of the National Archives and the Media History Digital Library. Um, and so many of the great um, visuals from the trade publications in this presentation came from the Media History Digital Library. Here is a list of scholarly works that have informed this presentation. And finally, don't hesitate to contact me if you'd like to discuss this work further. My name is Stephen Charbonneau, and I'm Associate Professor of Film Studies at Florida Atlantic University. And my presentation is entitled Splitting the Screen, Urban Rebellion, Participatory Documentary, and Hartford Project. So the experiences, the film experiences, the films, the documents um, represented here in this presentation and referred to here uh, were, um, were found in the National Archives. And so this research comes out of research directly connected to the, to the National Archives. The materials are um, uh, I've worked with before, I've published on, written on already, but I'm also sharing them because I'm continuing to, I find myself returning to these materials as new archival um, records get processed. I, I find myself returning to them and also putting them into new critical frameworks as well. And I'm finding um, new productive ways to re-engage this material. So the context here is my research in general into documentary, Canadian documentary filmmaking, and especially participatory documentary filmmaking. And so the even more specifically, this research focused on the development of a Canadian participatory uh, documentary model known as the Fugger Process. And this was designed by uh, Colin Lowe, Julian Biggs, and others when they, as, as um, filmmakers associated with the National Film Board of Canada and the Challenge for Change program, they, um, they sought to make, they, they reimagined filmmaking in relation to social change. And there was a sense that when making a film about a community, one is better off abandoning the old um, model, traditional model of making a documentary film about others and instead to involve those um, that community, members of that community in the filmmaking process itself to instead of make one film, you make many, in fact, dozens of shorter films that involve the community members in the production of those films. And then you screen them in town um, within a few weeks even possibly of shooting the film and use those screenings as a way to prompt discussion, debate, and in fact, um, new ways hopefully, of seeing the community, seeing oneself, and seeing the social problem or um, political issue that's dividing the community. 
And so these smaller films are described as vertical films by Colin Lowe. Um, and for him, it was they, these were vertical because they refused the horizontal imposition of the filmmaker when editing a longer form documentary. And so these were um, sometimes edited for sure, but very simply edited, sometimes um, featuring simple two shots of members of the community talking about their lives, talking about an issue of concern to them in the community. And so these vertical films were meant to be slices of life, either works of portraiture or works of quiet observation of community activities. It was a safe mode, quote unquote, because the filmmaker would be relatively less um, invested in communicating a point of view, supposedly. It was allowing the people involved to speak about an issue that concerns them. And so in that sense, there was a sense, a greater sense of yielding to the subject. Even if the camera may be still in control of the filmmaker, there's a sense of collaboration, editorial um, advising, and then of course the exhibition itself, the film was not an end point. The film was a means to an end. It was a means to discussion and consideration. So um, animating all of this is a kind of ideology of liberal solutionism, of the sense that um, intractable social political problems could possibly be mitigated by just having people <laughs> uh, view, simply listen or um, bear witness to um, their neighbors in ways that they aren't um, and in a way that maybe only cinema can engender. And that in seeing the world in a way, perhaps um, some sort of resolution will be arrived at. So this is a kind of liberal idealism, solutionism animating this filmmaking process. And in, um, so you can see here actually a cover of a report submitted by Colin Lowe, described as three-dimensional communication. And again, they did not talk about these films as films per se. They really saw this as less medium specific and really about um, the potentials of new communicative modes that could deal with social conflict. And this idea of a safe mode, this idea of verticality, in which the, verti in which the filmmaker uh, yields control on some level or tries to um, blunt their impact on the film, I think is precisely something that uh, you know, I've always I've tried to communicate some sort of critique of, and I think that's precisely something we should be critical of is that sense of presumed immediacy, especially when dealing with humans, human rights documentaries. And uh, Pooja Rangan wrote about this in her excellent book, Immediations, reminding us about this trope of immediacy when it comes to documentary, often made in the guide under the um, assumption that we're in an emergency situation, that that language of immediacy needs to be critiqued. And I think that gives us such a useful and powerful um, concept to, um, to, engage, to use to engage, critically engage these films that otherwise seem so simple. Um, and uh, so the, eventually the, the policymakers in Washington, DC and at the Office of Economic Opportunity sought to import and apply this um, participatory filmmaking approach to Hartford, Connecticut. And this was in 1969, about you know, basically the first year of the Nixon administration. And there was, of course, um, widespread unrest around social injustice, um, issues of racial inequality. And this was the case in many American cities, as we all know, especially in Hartford, the Puerto Rican, African-American communities um, were organizing and protesting persistent entrenched inequalities around education, healthcare, and employment, et cetera. And so as they're going into Hartford, Lowe is in, uh, has anxiety about uh, how they're going to be able to make connections with people on the ground. Um, now, uh, eventually they uh, have a new crew member um, joins them in Hartford. And this is Charles Butch Lewis, who was the founder of the Black Panther Party chapter in Hartford. And he's also a former Vietnam vet and he and respected you know, leader in the community, uh, African-American community. And so Butch Lewis decides to assist the filmmakers with this uh, uh, endeavor 
and in which they sought out to make, you know, two dozen or more short films about Hartford and the issues facing Hartford. And uh, Lewis is not so certain that this will accomplish anything, but Lewis also realizes that it's a chance for, it might, and it also is a chance for him to learn uh, filmmaking skills that he could uh, uh, apply in a professional sense too. So we saw it really kind of cleverly as just like a, a good way to learn some um, filmmaking skills. And so Lewis made, you know, and co-produced uh, several of the, or many of the films that were um, associated with the Hartford Project. About two dozen of these were filmed. One of which I was gonna show here is, um, features uh, Butch Lewis himself, along with Professor Oscar Walters from University of Connecticut, talking about their establishment of a street academy for um, African-American youth in Hartford, um, especially when the white um, school, public schools were um, uh, failing their, uh, their youth. So they talk a little bit about that in this film. And you'll notice, again, the safe mode, simple two-shot, allowing the, the subjects to speak about their lives and their experiences. But, it, but of course, I think this um, adoption of a safe mode is also reflects a certain kind of liberal solutionism that was animating the um, whole endeavor as well as even the um, OEO at the time. So why don't we listen to a brief clip from this and, and watch. Electric bass, guitar, drums, Academy had its own drums. Um, so the students played out in the backyard, you know. Mostly everybody in the neighborhood came out and sat out in the grass and listened. And went to a photography field. A lot of students got something out of it. We worked with sand building downstairs just now. That's how their um, photo lab started, in a sense. We used Polaroid land cameras a lot. The students learning how to, you know, use cameras. This was one field. And hopefully, you know, some of the students that did get something out of it, you know, We'll get a chance to get something out of it again in September if the Academy is, you know, is started without the funding, you know, like I said before. Of, of the various uh, organizations that we don't, we cannot function under, no street academy in the, in the Hartford area, if there ever be a street academy in Hartford area, could never function under these specific organizations that I named. You know, the main, like the Urban League and the main like problem is, is, like Butch was saying, like we had... We had ideas in terms of education, say like using the Polaroid land cameras uh, to sort of bring out things that, that a child or a student, a young man, might normally be inhibited about bringing out. So he would take the camera. In the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there. I find it really interesting too here. They talk about the use of the cameras with the students um, and letting the students uh, creatively express themselves with the cameras and that all also allowing for them to open up in interesting ways. So it was a, a, just an interesting synchronization between the way they talked about their education model and also the way that the discourse around the FOGO process evolved um, as well. So, but at the same time, so again, these films are fascinating for the personalities, for the communities, for the um, kind of issues that get highlighted. So there's a real historical value to these films. But as a film media scholar, I also want to be aware of and be critical of the um, the ideological suppositions behind these films about um, assuming that in some ways, I think the assumption is that the real problem is a failure to communicate, a failure to truly see, a failure to truly listen, as opposed to really sort of grappling with deeper structural issues. But, you know, there's a tension here. People are talking about the structural issues in the films, but at the same time, it also seems like the endeavor um, overall with the communication project, this three-dimensional communication is also very limited. Um, so I'm gonna stop there in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Hello, I am Dr. Harrington and I'm going to be talking about the Correctional Officer Series. Um, it's an archived in the Bureau of Prison Records at the National Archive and Records Administration. Uh, these films are dated from 1976 to 1981 and they're produced by Charles Cahill and Associates. 
Um, and there's more films uh, than the ones that are actually available um, at the National Archive, um, but the National Archive has the most cohesive collection of them. So there's about 40 films in the series, uh, but um, there's 18 that you can actually find at NARA all together in this collection, which is the most I was able to find um, anywhere. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about why these films are interesting, um, what kind of discussion they can be sort of productive of. Um, and I also have an article that I wrote about several of these films um, that goes into more depth than this presentation can. So the citation for that is at the end of my presentation. So I just wanted to um, let you all know that that's available if you find it interesting. Um, so these are the films we're talking about. Um, Variety of topics here. You've got cell searches, dining room conduct, you've got physical exercise and, and diet. Um, so some things that are kind of like daily tasks, daily concerns, and then you have um, some less mundane concerns around things like crisis negotiation, um, as in if if you're taken hostage, the 1981 film. Um, so variety of lengths, variety of um, topics here. Um, and there are some sort of interesting challenges in terms of this film series being applicable for a variety of contexts. Excuse me, context. Um, but um, one thing that I want to say before we get into that is just that there is a very important context in terms of the national conversation about incarceration happening at this time. Um, and the Attica Rebellion is really key to that. Um, so if you're not aware, in 1971, um, right after the killing of George Jackson in San Quentin State Prison, um, the Attica Rebellion occurred. Um, Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York at the time, ordered state troopers to take over um, Attica Prison, the Attica Correctional Facility in Attica, New York. Um, and as a result, 39 lives were lost, right? Um, there was an investigation afterwards. There was a lot of uh, media coverage of this, um, and one of the results of that was the Attica Report, uh, which has a textual version and also um, was televised, and you can actually find the televised version, um, a tape of the televised version at NARA, uh, at the National Archives, so that's available. Um, but there's a lot of criticism of corrections um, as a profession, as a field, and as a group of people um, that comes out of the Attica Report and the general coverage of the Attica Rebellion. So it's a pretty important um, context for this series, um, especially considering you know, this series can be considered part of a general push to professionalize training, right? Um, and that push didn't come from nowhere. It was partly in response to criticism, right? Um, so getting back to kind of what I referenced earlier, uh, one of the challenges of a series like this is that um, there's a general push to professionalize and within professionalization there's this idea of standardization, um, but corrections facilities and policies in the United States have never been standardized, right? Uh, the carceral landscape is a localized sort of collection of institutions. Um, institutions have their own ideas about how to um, facilitate proper dining conduct. Um, they have their own uh, building layouts that really impact um, what their policies are as well, right? Um, so that's part of the reality that the Correctional Officer Series is uh, dealing with. Right? Um, so as a result, the series consistently asserts itself as applicable to a variety of contexts because it doesn't have the specific institutional and state regulation particulars. Right? So for example, in cell searches, narrator states, there are differences across institutions, but for everyone, you have to be systematic, be thorough, and be curious. Right? They use these title cards. Um, for di in Dining Room Conduct in 1978, the narrator states, since every institution is so different, this program won't review seating procedures, but in every case, it's your attitude and your alertness that determines how effective you are. Right? So there's a lot of emphasis on attitude, and there's a lot of emphasis on um, these kind of very general qualities rather than didactic instruction. Right? Uh, the Correctional Officer series frames itself, ironically, for training film and for prison film, not as a condescending institutional directive, but as an occasion for contemplating one's own experiences, knowledge, and attitude as a corrections officer. 
The Correctional Officer Series consistently offers itself not as an authority, but as an opportunity for self-reflection and development to a certain point. This is not to say that the series is evacuated of concrete examples and routines, but rather that the purpose of displaying routine is often framed as an example of the correct approach to the task as opposed to being one that should be exactly replicated. So what I'm basically trying to highlight here is that one of the things that's really interesting about the correction, uh, Correctional Officer Series is that um, it can't deal with the really um, the fine grain sort of um, policy and procedure in terms of the everyday. And that leaves a lot of space to actually talk about um, what is the job of a corrections officer? Um, how should they go about it in terms of attitude, in terms of the resultant relationship with the incarcerated? Um, how does society consider corrections, right? There's a lot of space for talking about these sort of bigger, um, perhaps more philosophical uh, considerations. Um, so that's my introduction to the Correctional Officer Series. Um, there's a lot more that we could talk about here. Um, there's a lot of um, sort of negotiating anxieties around gender and um, sexuality and race that also comes up in this material. Um, but I wanted to sort of, from the offset, kind of give you the, the larger view of one of the um, sort of entryways into why this series is interesting and how it can be productive of um, how instructional film itself can also be uh, very interesting. All right, thank you very much. Okay, if I could ask my uh, the panelists to rejoin, turn your cameras and your microphones back on. We will get started with the question and answer period. And I will start with uh, a question for Tanya. Um, and the question is as follows. You characterized your object of study, the complex system of film distribution and screening as uh, an ecological system or a kind of film ecology. Can you elaborate on that particular choice of terminology? And in the background of this question are concepts that are right now you know, circulating in film and media and social theory, such as infrastructure, networks, or even the comeback of the concept of milieu. Um, so are there overlaps and possibilities to connect with these with this wider field of concepts as well. And Tanya, you are muted still. There we go. Sorry. Florian, this is, is such a because I see it's from you. This is such such a great question. And it's something I'm still working through like what is the correct term infrastructure ecology i find that in my presentations thus far i've kind of been using them interchangeably which is inaccurate and something i'm still very much in the process of thinking through um, one of the things that i think is really fascinating with with the 16 millimeter distribution work is thinking about it in terms of an infrastructure and this sort of weird disconnect between um infrastructure which we often think of as this concrete thing um you know lisa parks calls it stuff you can kick and here it's what does a historical infrastructure look like that's no longer extant um is sort of a methodological question that i think is interesting so the ans the general answer is i don't have a good answer yet but it's something that i'm that i'm definitely very aware of thinking through i think i use ecosystem just you know metaphorically as a way because there are just so many different types of um participants and locations and i think it really is a nice metaphor to just capture really how diverse um and how eclectic the participants are i mean studying non-theatrical distribution is a field that Cecile Starr says is known for its staggering confusion, which I just think is 
really the way to describe it. Um, and I deliberately in the excerpts from the film that I selected have two where it is just this long list of like, and you can screen it at this place and this place and this place. And it's almost, you know, my title of my presentation was too wordy as is the film itself in just telling you how often it is there. Um, but I would love at some point to see if any other, if any other panelists have any thoughts on ecosystem or just talk about it at a future date because this is such oh, a great question. Let's, let's, let's talk about it right now because okay. I think, um, yeah. this is actually, this was something that came up for me while listening to the panel, uh, at least the overlap between Stephen's paper and, and, and yours, the, the notion of participation. Um, and, and maybe we can extend it also to you, Catherine, the, but, but uh, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily try to try to shoehorn all the talks into this, but at least b between Stephen and Tanya, the, the participatory looms large for both of you. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, is it a, what, what, what kind of a fit is it? Uh, what are the, what are the overlaps and then what are the disjunctions? Cause I don't think you know the sort of the war 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 bond drive and um, the the what is it the OEO are are, are totally uh, analogous, but 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 they seem to share some key features, and so I'm curious to to hear you to uh, talk that out. That would be fun. Uh, sorry, Tanya, I'll just take it. Oh, you please please stab at this. <laughs> One of the things that makes this topic so challenging for me this particular historical experience um, is because these, these films are sort of abject. They were considered a failure. They were sort of disavowed by many of the participants and some of the policymakers at the OEO, um, one of whom is Ann Michaels. And one of the reasons I think it, these are discarded or considered a failure was, and I'm gonna put it my own way, is that they were almost too participatory in that Ann Michaels and even Colin Lowe later felt that the films were becoming too political, too focused on divisiveness, and that this was going to undermine their effectiveness um, at smoothing over social, dis social and racial discord. And so it's interesting that on the one hand, there's a desire for the filmmaker to have the filmmaker efface themselves in the face of uh, community expression, but on the other hand, they felt they were losing control of it, and so there was anxiety over that what, what whatever participatory uh, qualities were coming through. There was anxiety over that, and so that's some of the that's one of the things that's fascinating about this project is to a certain extent it, it, it's a failure, and in a way they got caught up in the um, contradictions of their own discourses there. Now, I, you know, for, I think, I don't know, Tanya, how this would overlap. I mean, these are technologies of citizenship. These are, I think, this was an attempt to impart a sense of common, a common civic identity to residents of Hartford. Maybe that's a place to overlap here is that to be a good citizen, you need to participate. And so there's some notion here of participation, good citizenship. In my case, it's sort of failing. In your case, it seems like it's succeeding. <laughs> I don't know, that might, that might be one way to think about this. Yeah, I was, I was wondering about that issue, the, the failure and the success metric. Tanya, do you want to say something about, because I mean, it does seem that from the way you've uh, characterized the, the, um, the campaign that it was a, a raging success. Uh, do you, how much of that do you think is maybe, you know, a little bit of hyperbole or overstatement or, or is, it, is it legitimately like creating uh, something functional where previously there was, was not, uh, you know, a kind of a, 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 an actual useful network? Yeah, I think, you know, 
there, it's so easy to fall into, especially with World War II propaganda and the happy happiness of success and all of their own sort of rhetoric about themselves and how great they were. But I do think that at least for me, looking at like the data and having hard numbers that they were able to reach 32 million people in these screenings to me seems, you know, quite impressive, especially because I'm always thinking about this in terms of Hollywood, which to me has such a tightly organized um, distribution pattern, whereas for these other instances, I think, you know, what I what intrigues me so much about this, and it's impossible to, to really study the full scope of non-theatrical, and I've recently had some really great kind of conversations about how we might approach non-theatrical from with scale in a kind of a larger macro approach as opposed to the micro histories that describe the sort of stories that we're telling. Um, but so for me, I, like, I do think that they were pretty successful. And I think about it more in that level of, you know, that the people in small towns that were able really to participate, I mean, and, and in making these screenings and things, I think was really kind of powerful. So I suggest it's sort of like, yes, of course, there were plenty of, you know, non-theatrical activities before this period, but this I think is really this mass scale where we're getting people. And there's a great article that I uh, have in my asset in that I cite, made sure to cite by uh, Brownell that really just goes into, you know, gives this really tight example of this one guy who, you know, in Michigan, who just got really enthusiastic and did all his own events. So I think it allowed for tremendous participation and agency that then I think further helped naturalize, um, you know, non-theatrical and distribute, like non-theatrical, non-Hollywood activities um, in the post-war period. So this was the world, you know, this 35 to 45 period is really significant in that adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and uh, as we've been talking, I. I realized how to bring uh, Catherine in, which is that, you know, what was the participatory uh, feature of this film series, of, of your mm -hmm. film series? Uh, I was really struck by your characterization of it as more an opportunity for self-reflection. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, there was a question yesterday about sort of uh, additional media pamphlets, questionnaires, you know, maybe a test with, with this. It, it, is, is there a layer of that with this? And then how did, how did in the larger sense, how did this sort of uh, dynamic of participation function? Is, is that something that's, that, that you've been able to uncover? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I did go through textual records to try to find, you know, actual reference to this series um, at NARA. And uh, what I came up with was just kind of, general memos that were um, excited about the possibilities of film in a very general way <laughs> um, and a desire for a more cohesive approach to um, corrections uh, with film um, as opposed to pulling in films that were created by other like departments in the government um, you know making something that's specific to corrections there is a desire for that um, so I don't, in terms of, you know, other kinds of participatory um, pamphlets and stuff, I d I'm not sure about that, but uh, the, the reason why I frame it as something as, as, as a moment for self-reflection that's repeated over and over throughout the series is because it, the narration of the film is actually just, what do you think, like over and over and over, um, sometimes about questions that, ethically speaking, are troubling, right? Like some, some. <laughs> there's a film that asked, like some people say never to kill. What do you think, right? Um, so there's there's that level of participation. Um, there's also a sort of self consciousness around the the films themselves, sort of being aware that they might be kind of foisted onto corrections officers in a particular way. Um, there's a consistent um, repetition of, hey, if you're a new officer, um, this is going to be important for you. And if you're an experienced officer, this is a moment for you to remember what you already know, right? Um, so there's this, these, in the narration, there's these constant sort of invitations. Um, the other side in terms of thinking about participation is how they're, in terms of production, um, these are produced with real corrections officers um, 
the consultants that are listed are active professionals in the field. Um, they're not all the same for each film, but there is some repetition of in like different groups within the series. Um, and there's real incarcerated folks uh, that are being filmed uh, in terms of participating in the filmmaking, um, though they're not individually credited. They have like institutions that are credited in there. So that was actually what I wanted to ask about the participants in the film, which is the question I initially when Oliver asked. So there were, can you elaborate a bit more on, you know, who was in, there were actual prisoners in the film and then also, <clears throat> Yeah, like, so, sorry, can you please elaborate? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of facilities that you see repeated in terms of the credits. Um, uh, Chino, there's a lot of California based uh, filming and uh, facilities, which kind of goes in line with the history of mass incarceration in California sort of being at the forefront of that. Um, and then there's particular consultants that um, pop up. Um, there's one that wrote this book, uh, Criminals, <laughs> Con Games, <laughs> um, How You Can Profit From Knowing Them, Games Criminals Play. And uh, that's the guy that's credited for Con Games Inmates Play, the film. Um, and this, that's actually a book that uh, was utilized in training for corrections officers for many decades. Um, so there's that sort of uh, connection with the, the professional field. Um, it's difficult for me to sort of speak to um, the way in which the incarcerated individuals were kind of roped into this, <laughs> in this production. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that they are, they have roles. They have, they um, were actors in, in these, in these films, um, even though they are not individually named. Um, so, you know, thinking about sort of the ethics of these films and whether they were um, sort of a next level of exploitation or um, something else, you know, is something that I, that I do think about. Catherine, since uh, we're on the topic of your films, there's a question, a follow-up question, um, not directly, but sort of asking for more background about your research. Have you had a chance to compare and contrast the collections at the National Archives with more local collections, regional or city. Uh, so is there a kind of a, you know, a national perspective versus a, a, a more local perspective in the project? Um, so the, the way my project is framed is kind of bringing in this series as a way of talking about, um, a way to talk about prison film, getting away from constantly asserting itself as real and authentic in the fictional realm. So I, it's not a longer, a larger project about um, instructional film for corrections officers in a lot of different locations. Um, what I will say is I'm sure there is um, in institutions that have sort of archival, um, have an archive, I'm sure there is local uh, material. Um, I think one of the places that you'll find potentially more um, local stuff besides actual institutions is actually uh, college libraries that have in institutions that have criminology programs. Um, so if you're looking for actual uh, more local stuff, um, but it's tricky because, uh, like I said, institute like the carceral landscape is a localized sort of situation. So in order to um, you kind of have to either go really broad or go really focused <laughs> um, in order to get a sense of how things were made specifically and um, what their exhibition practices were. Yeah, well, it sounds like a future project for you or someone else. Um, question for Stephen. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned the Challenge for Change program. Mm -hmm. Have you uncovered discussions between Canadian and American governments about strategies for documentary production uh, and particularly this participatory model? Yes, well, the, this whole chapter, um, I mean, mostly I focus on the importation of the FOGO process into the United States. Uh, of course, the OEO was engaged in film production of all kinds to promote its programs. And I, I think there's some awareness of National Film Board 
on the part of the OEO and especially his public affairs office, which was often described as a kind of laboratory for trying different things. But that really came through with the case of the FOGO process. And I think um, the, uh, that, that's, the, that's the one that I'm focused on. And that, again, it was Ann Michaels, I believe, who um, took note of this, these kind of community development workshops in the wake of FOGO, there were workshops um, being held in Canada to promote this kind of methodology. And I think they were, and I'm just going based off, I really have to give kudos to Susan Pennybaker at Trinity College. It is, Trinity College um, received prints um, donated to them by Butch Lewis, and it led to an extensive oral history project where they interviewed many officials there at the OEO about the background here. And what comes through in those transcripts is a feeling of trying to think outside the box, a feeling of trying to think about new ways of using film to facilitate communication, which on some level, as I already mentioned, was seen as being part of the problem. But I think, um, anyway, I'm not really, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but um, I think in particular, uh, I think the looking north was a way of trying to think outside the box. And, and I think Ann Michaels, I think Herbert Kramer was the head of the public affairs office. They were kind of really trying to think of new ways of using communication media. And I think that's Canada inspired it. Um, Challenge for Change, I think, inspired that. Um, so I, I guess I'll stop there. I'm kind of. So, so it sounds like yes and no. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, no specific direct links, but kind of definite connections in terms of ethos and outlook and kind of a larger. Uh, right. Uh, attitude towards this kind of work. I think there was a misunderstanding too. I mean, it's that you could import something. I mean, I think already it's questionable how successful this process was, even you know, in Newfoundland, in Fogo Island. I think the, there was a perception of success that is questionable that scholars have shown really had more to do with organizing on the ground than the films. And I think there was an excitement and enthusiasm to embrace this and run with this myth of success by applying it in the United States was very different political terrain. And so um, that led to a lot of debate and confusion on the ground and, and so on. So yeah, I think it was inspiration, but then the application uh, is then it's is unique, I suppose. Got it. And uh, a note for, for you uh, from one of the organizers, um, Susan Meehan, who was part of the pilot precinct project in DC, mm. pushed back on the idea that OEO was a failure mm. and said it was because of Nixon or the Nixon administration um, coming in and dismantling as much of the program uh, as, as they could that the sort of the failure label got, got attached or, 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 or could be seen to, 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 to describe the program. So thoughts about that? Does, does that seem relevant? So I just want to be clear, I, I, I'm, when I talk about failure, I'm talking about this endeavor in Hartford in particular. So I think OEO ha had lots of success. Um, I think that's absolutely true, though. Once the Nixon administration comes in, the OEO gets uh, transformed or gutted, depending on how you want to look at it. And so for sure, that's um, a backdrop. I think what's interesting is to relate it specifically to this, what I'm talking about, um, it's interesting that their first iteration occurs in fall of 68, right? Run up through the election. They're in Central Valley. They're in California in an agrarian context, working with Mexican-Americans Mexican in Farmersville. And then when they go to Hartford, now it's a different institution. And so the momentum that carries them from California to Hartford traverses Johnson and Nixon. And suddenly now you have an OEO that is being run by Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> um, overseeing this. And so there's a certain momentum that carries them through the Hartford, but from above there's certainly, I was highlighting the tension on the ground, but there certainly was tension above as well. And I have audio of Colin Lowe, I spent eight, uh, he's very gracious. I spent eight hours with um, him and his wife at their home just talking about this. And he, ta he told some interesting stories about getting chewed out by Rumsfeld in the in his office. <laughs> and so there definitely was tension above, too, about 
turning things around and, and this, you know, this uh, new, new set of priorities. So, but when I say failure, I'm really referring to the, the film endeavor itself um, on the ground in Hartford and some of the frustrations around that on the part of Ann Michaels, as well as the filmmakers too, who were all kind of had, you know, had a, a disagreement about how much they should be quote unquote political and allied with the activists on the ground or how much they should be above the fray. And so that was a constant debate. Yeah, okay. Um, question for Tanya, uh, or first a comment, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, and the question is, would you say that the OWI mostly tapped in to existing networks of distribution for wartime theatrical films, or did it significantly contribute to the building of new networks as a result of its efforts to you know, unite and tie together things that already existed? I would absolutely say that it leveraged as much as what existed already to do their work, especially because when the budget got gutted, if, you know, so there was this like sort of goal the, when the ODWI is founded in June 42 by, I think it's July 43, they get their new budget and they're like, no, you have no money. So there was this tremendous, like exciting period when it first started that we were going to produce all these films and we were going to have these regional people who were going to get appointed to do things. And then that kind of got curtailed. And the second half of it was, what are we going to do, you know, and how can we just leverage what we have with no budget? But, you know, I, I forget the exact number because I've seen it go anywhere from by the war's end, we have three or 400 different people, distributors, depositories, libraries that have worked with the OWI to help get films out. And it was all about gaining expertise from people who are already in the field. So these OWI newsletters that went out that I'm writing a lot about um, in my dissertation have, you know, people in the field like, oh, this is what I've done that has been successful. And then they highlight it to then, you know, pass out. And the way that it worked um, organizationally, there, there were nine, and of course they're all escaping me besides the YCMA, YMCA Film Bureau, like these nine monster groups that already existed that were considered the national distributors. And then there were all these other major groups regionally that they would contact and then be like, cool, you distributors, here are some prints, figure it out. Or if you want a print of this, leave us alone and contact this distributor who is working with a lab to get prints. So they were very much leaning on the expertise um, and people within these smaller companies. And C.R. Reagan is someone who comes up everywhere and he is this, there are a ton of trade organizations. So he is, they all, and they change names like a hundred times. So the two big ones are, there's a national, Sorry, non-theatrical association of, sorry, of course I'm spacing on all of them. There's like multiple trade associations that form this national 16 millimeter film committee. And so the answer is really leveraging anyone who knew anything to help them out in their endeavor. And very few people obviously were on the payroll to do this. It was just, this is our job, it's benefiting our business. And one of the things that actually comes up in my research is this frustration, I, I'm studying this guy named Tom Brandon, who has a really fascinating career as a leftist who then starts working with the government during the war. And he had commit, he had actually produced like some, some films in early 1942, educational films about the war effort. And then he gets really frustrated when he finds out like, I just made this film called Salvage. And now you're making a film OWI called Salvage. And how, so my investment is ruined. He's, he's a very complicated figure, but, um, but again, this, this, there's just so many kinks to work out and they were trying as best they could to get expertise from these people like C.R. Reagan or Brandon or plenty of other people who had been these leading figures um, in the fields. It makes me wonder, can we, can we talk uh, in any meaningful sense about a, a connection between this story that you're telling, Tanya, and the uh, um, agencies that you, Stephen, and Catherine are, are studying, you know, is this creation of the 16 millimeter infrastructure mm -hmm. in some way, you know, the uh, an early phase in the creation of these others, or is it too, too diffuse to really make meaningful uh, connections here? Thoughts on that? So the these films were shot on 16 millimeter. 
Um, so I think just to clarify that, um, it's probably obvious, but uh, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, uh, th there's, I think there's a civic mindedness that persists across all of these projects. And it seems like there's, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm improvising here a little bit, but, but that 16 millimeter format implies a kind of pliability, a kind of flexibility, a kind of applicability to everyday life, right? Able to get into the nooks and crannies of everyday life in order to shed light on that, in order to um, uh, help us reflect on our everyday maybe behaviors in certain ways in order to cultivate a sense of citizenship. It seems like some of that 16 millimeter, I don't want to fetishize it too much, but it seems like there's a narrative around it 16 millimeter that seems to cut across these. That might be a I don't know. That's a that's a first stab at that, I guess. I would say well improvised. Yeah, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, mine are also originally 16 millimeter, um, and I don't I don't know if I can speak to like a broader sort of institutional situation, but I can say that there was actually a memo um, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons records that was very excited about eight millimeter um, <laughs> in 1970. So. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, so let's shift uh, focus for a moment. There's a question uh, very kind of uh, deceptively simple question that says, can you speak to uh, discourses concerning aesthetic qualities um, that you encountered in regards to the films that you address? So this is for everyone. Whoever wants to go first, please go ahead. I would say my, my the one I showed I think is probably the probably has the least um, aesthetic theories behind it. Although it's very you know there it's kind of typical of government informational prac of government informational films. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I nothing I have found indicates that this one was specifically conceived to do anything you know <laughs> particularly inventive um so i would say this is probably a better question for stephen um and catherine but i am happy to elaborate on government um propaganda aesthetics um should there should no one else want to contribute but my film seems like the odd one out for this question <laughs> um i can <clears throat> in terms of this uh, i don't i don't know in terms of um that the <laughs> that there is a discourse around around instructional prison film <laughs> aesthetics, but uh, there is an attempt to make these both comfortingly instructional with like intertitles, um, and then also not completely boring, if if that makes sense. Um, so there's like a use of long shots. There's like a introduction to the to prison aesthetics, um, or rather I should say prison iconography is utilized in a way that kind of, to me, looks like it's carrying over from theatrical prison film a little bit. Um, there's also a use of sound. There's like a bluesy harmonica that kind of reminds you of um, some prison, some actual work that's been done in terms of um, uh, work crew songs, like the Lil Max folks, but, um, uh, and there's also a little bit of playing with um, uh, perspective a little bit uh, in order, which I'm just bringing up because part of what I talk about is um, the ways that the incarcerated folks are uh, visually being positioned as objects of suspicion. Um, so there's, there's like playing with the gaze in, in particular ways um, that are, um, you know, not as straightforward as you might expect um, from a, a correctional uh, <laughs> film, an instructional film that is, you know, how do you walk through a dining room safely? So with, as I kind of discussed in the lecture or the presentation um, that I gave, the aesthetics were, I think, talked about a lot by the filmmakers and it all extends out of this desire to operate in a safe mode, a mode in which the filmmaker effaces 
discursively effaces their impact on what we see. So it's interesting too, to put this in the context of non-theatrical where we might think of an instructional grammar around um, a voice of God or a voice of authority narration that's providing a clear, clear sort of lesson. And, and this, these films are sort of the, uh, intended to be the opposite of that, trying to efface any kind of horizontal imposition and let the subject speak for themselves. This leads to a kind of a lot of long takes, um, minimal editing, as I said before, two shots and a kind of stillness sets into these films because they're designed to provoke contemplation in the theater and then discussion afterwards. Um, but of course, I think the uh, there's still, that's still an aesthetic that's designed around um, uh, pr promoting um, transparency and promoting communicative liberal ethos, where it's as if the only thing we need in order to solve these problems is to simply just see and listen to each other. And if we just see and listen to each other, somehow we'll figure this out. And so I think beneath that simplicity, belying that underneath that simplicity is a idealism that um, is problematic, obviously. So, um, so the, the aesthetic is actually really important in these films in order to win the trust over from the from the community, because everyone's worried about being edited in a way that makes them look bad. So if they can try to keep it as simple as possible, they, the filmmakers are trying to win over the trust. Um, but ultimately, I think it's um, also guided by that um, desire to, to truly listen and truly see each other. So the aesthetics are, are really important as simple as they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, for, for Tanya, uh, you mentioned department stores as one of the exhibition sites for Bond films. Where'd you come across this reference? And do you have any more information about what stores and uh, where they were? And I think, you know, this would also be a good moment for uh, everyone to talk a little bit about the exhibition context for the films um, that, that, that you were discussing today. Sorry. Hi, Liz. Uh, great question. Um, so my sources, I, I came from, I used the Media History Digital Library, which again, everyone should look at. And so a lot of them came up in Business Screen, which is one of the trade publications um, where I got a lot of good information and photos. So I haven't gone into any specific um, details on department store screenings, but there's a lot of really good information that you could probably glean, I think, especially out of business screen for those type of um, historical um, information. Um, so, but yeah, it was, it seemed to be, and I've researched all types of sort of non-theatrical screenings and types and department store, you know, it's amazing to see how much film and department store windows and things were being used back in like even the 1920s. So it's sort of a fascinating you know, under-examined uh, picture. But yeah, I think Business Screen, um, on which you can access Media History Digital Library would give you um, a lot of great information on that. And I would love to know, Stephen and Catherine, a little more about screenings of, of your films as well. Um, I... <laughs> I can say I wish I wish there was <laughs> there was um, archival evidence in terms of exhibition practices. I can tell you that um, when I first went before I found the collection at NARA, um, there was kind of a there's a nationwide distribution of a scattering of these films across uh, college libraries um, uh, that have criminology departments. So um, if you can extrapolate from that, I think there's been a widespread sort of use of these films, um, possibly because they are so sort of generalized and they don't sort of stick to one institutional sort of policy framework. Um, but other than that, it's it's very difficult to um, really say with any certainty um, how they were used in terms of federal prisons, in terms of state prisons, in terms of jails. Um, so I, I can only say that I'm, I think they've been dispersed <laughs> and I speak more to the sort of intention of the filmmakers and what we can sort of productively make out of that. 
Let's, can I chime in for one second? I'm curious if, if one, you've ever found evidence of paper materials like study guides or things being produced with them. And then the other thing is it also opens itself, the fact that you don't know opens itself to like a really interesting sort of like speculative history of, ex, of, of exhibition to think about, you know, because I would imagine it would be in some sort of classroom-esque or, you know, room sort of context and there'd be you know, maybe someone who's facilitating discussions around the film. So I, around the films, I think is really, you know, interesting. Yeah, I, I do think there's an entire history around, you know, how to, <laughs> how to have these kinds of discussions with corrections officers that has a lot of things that can be mined. Um, I have actually come across the kinds of pamphlets and things that you're talking about, just not paired with this particular mm -hmm. film series. So like mm -hmm. there is evidence for some kind of practice of that in this time period, um, just just not paired with my materials, unfortunately. <laughs> so in my case, I have lots of detail about the exhibitions of these films, the project, before. So in fall of 68 in Farmersville, California, um, I have detailed documents um, indicating the um, frequency of the screenings, the numbers of people in attendance, and what was discussed. I don't have that for Hartford. Um, and I think it speaks to the fact that there was some discord on the ground and so there's a lot of ambiguity. I do know that in March of 69, to promote the project, there were screenings of the Farmersville uh, films to the city council in Hartford to give the city council a sense of what the crew was going to be doing from April until July. I don't think they, I'm not sure they really made it until June, to be honest. And the mayor was was quoted in the paper, the Hartford Current as being very nervous about what <laughs> these filmmakers are going to find. And, um, and so I have, uh, that's, that's, um, that's something I'm still pursuing. So it's interesting, I have a lot of information about pretty much every, I have info on every screening when the crew was in California, don't have that for Hartford. Part of that is a lot of that information I got in so many different places um, some of those documents were in the possession of former crew members, and we were able to get them archived at the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA, and I was able to access it that way. Some material I got from the um, Lyndon Johnson you know, the Presidential Library. The next step is to think to go to Nixon and, and wait for those Rumsfeld papers to get processed, and so there may be information in the Rumsfeld collection because he was the head of OEO at, the, at this time. So, um, so anyway, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Um, I think Alexandra, you were gonna um, bring something up as well. I wanna. Yes, yes, I, I was. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alexandra Geitz. I'm a supervisory archivist in the Moving Image and Sound Branch. And I just wanted to jump in because I'm sure a lot of you in the audience are like myself and you've been listening to this wonderful conversation and thinking, I gotta, I gotta see those films they're talking about. And, uh, and you're in luck because actually the films that Stephen has been um, referencing for the Hartford series, we've digitized, our preservation film lab has digitized um, most if not all of those films and they're available in our online catalog actually um, in record group three, one, the records of the Community Service Administration. So if you go to our catalog and search there, you'll be able to um, view and download those films if you're interested. And I would make a, you know, similarly for the other um, films that have been mentioned as well, the, um, the victory bonds that uh, Tanya had mentioned, uh, we have, uh, some of them have been digitized um, and are available in our catalog in the Department of Treasury Records. Um, and others that have not been digitized, uh, you can reach out to us uh, at the mopix at nara.gov email address. We can give you more information about those um, as well. And unfortunately for Catherine's, uh, the series of records that Catherine has been talking about, the corrections um, officer program series, we don't have the digitized versions of those available in our catalog, but we do have the item um, information uh, for each of those titles available. So you can search for those, find the titles if you're interested in learning more. Again, reach out to us. Um, and yeah, any 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 questions come to us for mopix at, at nera.gov. We'd be happy to help you. 
Thank you, Alexandra. That's always wonderful to find out about how much of this material is not just there, but easily accessible and becoming more so all the time. Um, we're getting close to the end of our session. There's, there's a question that came in for Noah. I wanna to try to repurpose it or share it. Um, and the question for Noah was about uh, the Hollywood's quote, incursion into Ni Nigeria. And the question was if there are other kinds of nonfiction government sponsored cinematic incursions. So taking that as a kind of a provocation for thinking about your, uh, your examples, um, does, that, does that dynamic make sense? Uh, what, what kind of things come to mind when thinking about uh, your, um, your case studies as uh, you know, a, a, a kind of um, imposition, invasion, in, in, in version. I think um, I'll just run with that for a second. Um, I think that uh, it's important to sort of, for my work, um, it was important to, um, the Attica sort of context is really important because the entire profession of corrections was kind of on the defense. Um, and one of the reasons they were on the defense was yes, because of the, the media coverage and the criticism of the Attica report. Um, but there already is at that point, a stereotype of corrections officers that's circulating in theatrical film that is, is not complimentary and is being spoken of as negative. Um, so uh, the, there's, there's kind of a sense of Hollywood, incur, and Hollywood incursion into corrections and, and creating this smug hack is the name of the sort of stereotype um, in terms of uh, corrections officers. Um, so there's really, a, there's an effort to kind of um, push back against that, right? Um, so not so much an incursion into Hollywood, but a, a push back against it. Any other thoughts? There's, a, there's another comment that I want to um, bring up um, before we close. Uh, by the late 60s, 16 millimeter projectors would have been pretty a pretty normal institutional piece of machinery. And in addition, the vast majority of these projectors came equipped with microphones, normalizing the idea of parallel commentary and live presentational modes for these kinds of films. So I, I guess this is primarily for um, Stephen and Catherine. Any, any, any evidence of the, the, the use of the built-in microphone with the projector to, to do voiceover or um, uh, you know, kind of have, have that additional layer? Not for, not for me, I don't believe. There's no evidence of that on my end. I know that the... Um, the crew was probably adopting a more traditional industrial model on some level. They were working in California. They were working with UCLA film grad students. They were working with um, actually Verna Fields was a major, well, it's editing obviously was a big advisor here and they had trained sound recordists working on the, the, the shoots both in Farmersville and Hartford. So no, I, I will also just have to add really quickly, Oliver too, the theme of incursion is big for me as in, my, in this case, because the oftentimes folks on the ground were saying we've got this double dose of outsiders. We have Canadian filmmakers funded by DC coming into our community, <laughs> making films about us and why. So there was a double dose of incursion going on there. That's that's really interesting. So that theme of incursion I also want to say applies really well too. So. All right. Well, um, I just want to thank uh, you all panelists and, and attendees uh, both for, for this excellent session. Um, reminding everyone that the next panel, the, 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 the final panel that will follow this format starts at 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thanks everyone. All right. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks for organizing. Yep, thanks. This is great. Thank you.